the 45th commencement at Palo Alto University is now convened. Good morning. I am Dr. Erica Cameron, Provost and Vice President of Academic and Student Affairs. Welcome to Palo Alto University's 2024 commencement ceremony. On this joyous day, it is important that we humbly acknowledge that Palo Alto University's campuses sit on the land of the Tamian Oholoni speaking tribal territory, including the unceded land of the Muwakme Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. For our guests joining us in person and virtually, we are all members of communities that are built on traditional territories of indigenous nations. We give thanks for the opportunity to work, study, and celebrate together in, in their traditional homeland. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty forevermore. I would now like to take this opportunity to recognize our board of trustees who dedicate their time and support to ensure we fulfill our mission. Please rise and be recognized for your support and commitment to PAU. Now I would like the PAU cabinet to rise and be recognized for their leadership and guidance of the university. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to ask the faculty to rise and be recognized for their extraordinary commitment to our students and PAU. Thank you. It is my pleasure to invite our president of Palo Alto University, Dr. Maureen O'Connor, to the podium. This is such a wonderful, wonderful view. I wish you could all see your beautiful faces. Members of the Palo Alto University Board of Trustees, faculty, administrators, staff, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Miriam jernigan Noasi, all of our guests, family and friends who are here today to support the graduating class of our doctoral, master's and bachelor's programs. Welcome to Palo Alto University's 2024 commencement ceremony. As we begin, I want to acknowledge the events unfolding in our world. In these incredibly challenging and heavy times in our world, we need to lean into our commitments to inclusive excellence, to support each other and our community. We acknowledge that our work toward inclusive excellence tax takes place within a societal framework shaped by historical and ongoing injustices. Palo Alto University is dedicated to addressing pressing and emerging issues in mental health through education, research, and service. We understand profound impact of systemic oppression on the individuals we serve, students, faculty, staff, community members alike. As we strive to engage minds and improve lives, we affirm that our mission necessitates an unwavering commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and social justice. By embracing inclusive excellence, we dedicate ourselves to increasing access and success for underrepresented groups, for fostering an environment of respect and belonging, cultivating cultural responsiveness, establishing accountability measures, and engaging with our local communities. We acknowledge that this vital work requires sustained effort and shared responsibility. 
As we gather together, we invite every member of the Palo Alto University community to join us in advancing inclusive excellence and in the pursuit of a society that is just and equitable for all. Today, we are here to honor our graduates for their dedication in completing their degrees in psychology and counseling, and for the work that has been cataloged in classroom hours, in clinical and internship settings, witnessed in the faces of those you have served, and reflected in the pride of your mentors and faculty advisors. Let us also take a moment to recognize all of those who have made your journey here at PAU possible, your friends and family, those who have supported you, provided just that nudge you needed to complete your studies, believed in you, allowed you to spend countless hours away from them, parents, grandparents, partners, children, siblings, best friends, mentors, it truly does take a village. So members of the graduating class, please rise and join me in thanking all of those who have helped you to get to this day. Turn and say thank you. Thank you all. Please be seated. I would now like to invite Dr. Danielle Levy, Chair of the Board of Trustees of Palo Alto University, to bring greetings and well wishes on behalf of PAU's Board of Trustees. Thank you. On behalf of the Palo Alto University Board of Trustees, I want to welcome everybody to today's event and extend our heartfelt congratulations to all of you graduates of the class of 2024 and to your families. Um, I have had the privilege of serving on the PAU board for many years, and I'm continuously impressed by the caliper of our graduates and the unwavering commitment of our outstanding faculty and staff. Today, we celebrate the remarkable achievement of our graduates and reaffirm our commitment to our mission, vision, values, and strategic pillars. At Palo Alto University, we envision a world where understanding of human behavior fosters well-being, and helps us build more inclusive communities. Our mission through education, research, and clinical training in psychology, counseling, and soon social work as well, is to equip our students to address the evolving needs of humanity through compassion and excellence. This commitment is reflected in our strategic pillars, academic excellence, student success, operational excellence, awareness, and financial strength. As we congratulate our graduates, we also pledge ongoing support as they carry our values of diversity, inclusion, um, equity, and social justice into the world. So congratulations to the class of uh, 2024. Your journey holds boundless potential, and we eagerly anticipate the positive impact that you're going to be making in the world that needs you now more than ever. So go change lives, go change organizations, go change the world. Congrats. Now I will invite President O'Connor to introduce our commencement speaker and honorary degree recipient. It is my privilege to introduce this year's commencement speaker and honorary degree recipient, Dr. Mariam Jernigan Noesi. Dr. Jernigan Noesi is a licensed psychologist, clinician, educator, and organizational consultant who has served as a mental health provider for over two decades. 
She has worked in an array of clinical settings, including community, medical, forensic, and academic, as well as private practice. As the founder and CEO of Jernigan and Associates Consulting, she has provided social impact consulting to over 30,000 professionals at state and federal agencies, healthcare establishments, educational institutions, including PAU, and corporations. Dr. Jernigan Nuesi completed her advanced clinical training at the Center for Multicultural Training and Psychology at Boston Medical Center and Boston University School of Medicine. She served as a faculty member and tenure track professor in higher education for over 15 years and helped develop three clinical mental health counseling master's programs around the country. Her contributions as a clinical researcher have been recognized by the Ford and Mellon Foundations, as well as the American Psychological Association. Dr. Jernigan Noesi's current work focuses on culturally responsive patient engagement and treatment, racial and cultural impacts on clinical supervisors, oppression-based trauma, and more. She serves as the CEO of Psychologies for Racial Justice, a nonprofit committed to dismantling systemic racism and promoting social justice to build a more equitable and inclusive world. We are absolutely thrilled and honored to, that she has brought this expertise to her work with our faculty over the past year and will now share those wor wonderful work with you. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Miriam Jernigan Noesi to the stage. The trustees of Palo Alto University, on the recommendation of the university faculty and by the virtue of the authority vested in them, hereby confer upon Dr. Miriam Jernigan Noesi the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, and honors thereunto appertaining. <laughs> It is my pleasure to present to you our honorary degree recipient, Dr. Miriam Jernigan Noesi, who will now address the graduates. Good morning, everyone. To President O'Connor and Provost Cameron, esteemed faculty and staff, distinguished guests, proud parents and caretakers, the villages of families and friends, and most importantly, the graduating class of 2024. It is my honor and my privilege to be with you today during this significant milestone in your life. And as I look out at all of your beautiful faces, I am humbled, I am inspired, and I'm excited to share this momentous occasion with you. I'd like to dedicate this speech actually to my parents who were my first teachers and whose wisdom sowed the seeds and the importance of justice and equity and community in me. And I'd also like to dedicate this speech to my academic mother, who has been one of my greatest mentors and advisors. She's a leader in the field of psychology whose work has touched so many. And as a graduate student, Dr. Janet E. Helms challenged me in so many important ways and continues to do so today. So my commencement speech is actually based on a conversation that I had with Dr. Helms during the first year of my doctoral program at Boston College. I was getting to know her as my advisor and as a faculty member in that program. She met with all of her advisees on a weekly 
basis, taking great care to get to know us professionally and personally. And one might think that that is the sign of a good professor and a mentor, and it is. But for Dr. Helms, it was her way of holding all of her advisees and all of her students accountable. See, she pushed us to align our actions and our professional endeavors with our shared desires to contribute to the field of psychology. And on this day, when I sat across from that desk, looking at Dr. Helms a bit intimidated, she asked me to again share my research and my professional interests. And at that moment, I was confident. I'd answered these questions before. I talked about how I knew that as a child, I wanted to be a helping professional. See, I was the child of a proud Vietnam veteran. I have mem memories of going to vet centers and meeting my dad's fellow vets in our local community. And as that child, I watched these grown men lean against the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., crying as they remembered the fallen. And I did not fully comprehend the mental health consequences faced by humans who witness and endure and serve and survive the perils of war. And I also naively then believed that helping just one person at a time was enough. It was my undergraduate experiences in psychology that introduced me to the many health and social disparities that marginalized individuals and communities face. And therefore, my budding interests focused on the most vulnerable of populations. It was those youth and the families often overlooked with less access to quality, racially and culturally informed and responsive care. See, I told Dr. Helms how all of this is what influenced me to become, in this case, a mental health professional. Long story short, when I was done, she looked at me and simply asked, why should anyone care, Miriam? I did not see that coming. What does she mean? Because of course people should care. Why wouldn't they care? And at that time, the solution for me was to just uplift the voices and the narratives of the most marginalized, create better options, and just fix it. But for every response I gave, Dr. Helms came back with another question. And let me tell you, at some point I gave up. It seems I could not satisfactorily answer the, what I thought was her question. So I left her office with the goal of returning with an answer that I thought would impress her. What I could not see was at that moment, the question was not meant for Dr. Helms. Answering that question was for me. She was not just asking me to give her a rehearsed intellectual response padded with statistics and anecdotal information. She was asking me to feel and to connect and to articulate the importance of my interests for the human collective. She knew that my greatest asset would not solely be my ability to speak about the importance of empathy, compassion, and perspective as the stepping stones to equity and addressing those very disparities that I learned about, but to live it. Social justice, as she says, is not something we do, it is something we live. Through her questioning, Dr. Helms helped me to understand that we are allowed to have interests, you are allowed to have interests, but what good are those interests if we can't connect them to a why? It was a taller order. She expected me to know what ignited my passions and fueled my work because she knew that on our toughest days, on your toughest days, remembering your why is what will keep you going. I now understand that we cannot do the work of social justice alone because we all have a stake. And it is my responsibility to take ownership of my piece of the pie. See, the pie represents, as best-selling author and policy advocate Heather McGee says, the sum of us, and that's S-U-M. As emerging professionals in the fields of psychology and counseling, the issues we may encounter and the problems we hope to solve and the responsibility we carry for helping others to heal and to thrive is essential. They are also sometimes overwhelming. 
As you enter your careers, however, I want you to know that you represent a group of well-positioned and well-trained and well-prepared individuals to help answer that question of why anyone should care. You applied and you were accepted to PAU, an institution dedicated to addressing pressing and emerging issues in the fields of psychology and counseling in order to meet the needs of today's diverse communities. The needs of all of our communities will not be met if we remain siloed in our professional endeavors and focused on our individual accomplishments. The needs of our communities will not be met if we succumb to the antiquated beliefs that we can and we should somehow check who we are at the door of a therapy room or a research lab versus understanding that it is our responsibility to be self-aware and use that awareness. We can read as many books and articles as desired, but until we stop to process and to reflect and to connect with the communities we serve, our words and actions will likely be misaligned. The needs of communities are not met when we remain silent and choose our inability to tolerate alleged discomfort rather than boldly speak up for the sake of liberation for all. Needs are not met and the collective does not heal so long as we prioritize our own experiences instead of reminding ourselves that when we encounter something that is confusing or something that doesn't make sense, or something that fails to align with our per personal values, those are precisely the moments when we need to ask ourselves, what am I missing? What don't I know that will better help me to understand the perspectives of others? You see, we enter the field of psychology and counseling because we want to help. We believe in the power of change, and we understand and hope that through our work, those that we encounter may develop insights that lead to shifts in attitudes and beliefs that can bring about needed behavioral change and healing. So we have to understand that this work is not just about me or you. You know the harms and the consequences of what happens to those who are maligned and marginalized, siloed, removed, isolated, and who are not considered. You carry the narratives and the tools to promote the compassion that we so desperately need to see modeled in this world at this moment in time and history. You have sat and you will sit with the individuals who've been bullied because of their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, their disability, their neurodivergence, their social class, their age, their language, and more. You will encounter the feelings of that child of color who was told that they were less intelligent because of someone else's internalized assumptions about their capabilities. That child or that adult who was ostracized because the smell of their lunch in a communal setting was different. You will come to know the Muslim child and family teased and ridiculed in their own community, navigating Islamophobia because so many of us were never taught the beauty and the contributions of cultural and spiritual differences at an early age or even in graduate school for that matter. You will hear and see the lived experiences of manifestations of racism and anti-Semitism and xenophobia and ethnocentrism. You will work with the individual who was banished from attending family events because of their queerness. The family who de desperately wants to identify a healthcare provider who can treat them without judgment or ridicule or discrimination due to their gender identity. You will sit, you will teach, you will research about the adults struggling to build connection who are enduring epidemic rates of loneliness in this country while desperately looking for a sense of community. You have been taught by these faculty members and may yourselves proudly accept new positions in academia only to find that in some of those very hallways, the opportunity for the new job may also come with days of invisible and hyper-visible experiences at the same time. Your future office may be the one filled with trainees seeking refuge because their voices and experiences are marginalized relative to a status quo. So we have to care. There are no better folks prepared to show the world that we care. 
We have to care about the little girls who experience dream gaps because they are far too often told that it is they who need to do something different, to work harder, to contort themselves, to fit the unreasonable and inhumane expectations of patriarchal systems. We have to care about the little boys who are pathologized in school settings and classrooms for behaviors that far too often we know are developmentally appropriate. And for that matter, we have to advocate for the little black and brown children that we know are disproportionately surveilled and disciplined and pushed out of school systems. We have to care. We have to care that adults with disabilities report experiencing frequent mental distress almost five times as often as those without disabilities. And we have to care that the United States has the highest infant mortality rate and that black birthing persons have a higher risk of maternal mortality because that is grief and loss in all of our communities. We have to care that rates of suicidality and clinically significant depression and anxiety have risen twofold in children since 2020 and that older men have the highest rates of suicide of any group and yet we don't have enough researchers and practitioners focused on the mental health of aging. We have to care about those who migrate and seek refuge for what they may have endured right, to live a better life one that offers a sense of safety and a sense of security, all of the things that we deem important for ideal human development. And because the last time that I checked, other than the indigenous peoples of this place that we call the United States of America, many of our ancestors and elders transitioned by force or by choice. And for the indigenous peoples, their land was taken and removed. Our ancestors and elders, all of them, face transitions, if we dare to call them that, that were fraught with sacrifice. Their strength and their resistance fueled the generations of us who built upon those sacrifices. We have to care. And while we are caring, may we also remember the tales of resistance and the tales of joy. So the next time you take that family history and the next time you consider the context of a research participant or a client, see the humanity in all of us. Understand that the stories that many of our ancestors may have had to tell did not happen in the luxury of therapy rooms or on podcasts or YouTube for all to see. And they hold the historical and the intergenerational traumas and truths that you have read so much about. Those experience off, experiences offer us wisdom, and they give us the keys to sur survive and to thrive in community. As psychology and counseling professionals, we make the best advocates and activists because we are in position to do so by answering the question, why should anyone care? We know that for every child ridiculed, having at least one supportive adult in their life decreases mental distress. And we know that our research tells us that close relationships are the cornerstone of positive adaptation despite adversity. We know that cohesive and diverse neighborhoods serve as protective factors for our well-being. So may our answers to that question, why should anyone care, extend beyond the walls of academia and beyond the walls of private practices or administrative offices and beyond the waiting rooms of mental health agencies to connect us to our communities. We must be prepared to do the work and to take our piece of the pie. And so you also must be prepared to lead and to follow, even when there is no blueprint. We must care as we take that seat at the table or for some of us, pull up our own chair. And we must shake those very tables that we are told were never meant for some of us in the first place. And then I'll ask you to add some seats and make a circle. We must stop making individual humans responsible for the impact of our discriminatory systems, our biased policies and practices created so long ago, yet upheld today by the very humans who make up those systems. So we have a responsibility. My challenge, my charge, my wish for all of you, for all of us is to never forget our why and to never forget that on the backs and the shoulders of your elders and your ancestors, we get to do this. I, Dr. Merriam, get to stand on this stage because of the strength and the resistance of my grandparents 
who protected their children from the racial terrorism of the South. My grandparents, let that sink in. You are here getting this degree today that you chose in front of this audience who's cheering you on. And yes, for some of us, we may have chosen this path despite a lack of support, but from this day forward, you get to be the person to whom someone may entrust their innermost thoughts. You get to be the inspirational educator that future students learn from. You get to supervise the next generation of psychologists and counselors and social workers and healers. You get to be the next researcher who proposes that new framework, that new intervention, or that new tool for healing diverse communities. You get to be the peer that supports your colleagues and creates community. We get to support one another as we face the next unanticipated global crisis, conflict, war, natural disaster, and dare I say pandemic. We get to choose to forge together, to care for the well-being of all of us. And I will not lie to you, the work will not always feel good and it will not always be easy. I am the sum of those who have poured into me. And so I will leave you with some words of inspiration that have carried me and inspired me and reminded me of my why from some of my colleagues. May you speak the unspoken. May we understand, understand that every place and space and person does not deserve our loyalty if it compromises our sanity or our soul. And so you may have decisions to make. May we learn to call a thing a thing and to be unapologetic in the face of silence around us. May your connections and your co-conspirators in the name of justice be strong and longstanding. May the love and the support and the validation you feel today from your villages run deep. And I submit to you that it is our duty to help the world understand why we all need to care. So I hope that I've reignited some fire in you today so that you remember your why and you do not give up on our humanity. May your flames burn in the name of justice as you become educators and researchers and healers and trailblazers and advocates. And in the words of my eight-year-old who said to me when I was traveling here to be with you, to be good, mommy, we have to do good. And so, baby, I hope that mommy is making you proud. And may we all take charge of being good ancestors and leaving a legacy that shows the world and the next generation how much we care. So I want you to go forth and I want you to do good and I want you to be good. And while you are at it, in the words of the late racial justice advocate, John Lewis, get in some good trouble, <laughs> some necessary trouble. <laughs> because after all, all of our children are watching so what legacy will you leave? What legacy will we leave? So I say congratulations to the class of 2024, and I want you today to celebrate, and then I want you to come on back because we've got some work to do. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for those powerful and moving remarks, Dr. Jernigan Noesi. We are honored to have you join the class of 2024. Well, graduates, Palo Alto University, will now proceed with the official conferral of degrees. First, we will confer degrees for the Department of Psychology. Then we will confer degrees for the Department of Counseling. Will the candidates 
for the doctoral, master's, and bachelor's degree in the Department of Psychology, please rise. You have completed the requirements for the doctors, doctoral, master's, and bachelor degrees. The trustees of Palo Alto University on the recommendation of the university faculty and by virtue of the vested authority in them hereby confer upon you, hold on, hold on, don't go, don't go. <laughs> hereby confer upon each of you the doctoral degree or the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Psychology, Master of Science, or Bachelor of Science, with all the rights, privileges, and honors thereon appertaining. Please be seated. <laughs> Will the candidates for the master's degree in the Department of Counseling please rise? You have completed the requirements for the master's degree by virtue of the authority vested by the trustees of Palo Alto University and based on the recommendations of the university faculty, I hereby confer upon each of you the degree of Master of Arts with all the rights, privileges, and honors thereon to appertaining. Please be seated. The diploma indicative of the bachelor's degree will now be granted. The names of the bachelor's degree recipients will be read by professors representing the Department of Psychology. Degree recipients, please follow the directions of the candidate on your right. I'm pausing to wipe away the tears, just a minute. <clears throat> Congratulations again to our graduates. <laughs> Woo. Yes, yes. <laughs> I would just like to take a minute to thank all of the amazing people who have helped coordinate today's beautiful ceremony. The many faculty, staff, students, Provost Cameron, the incredible work that went on tirelessly for months behind the scenes to make us come together today in this beautiful celebration. So thank you to all of our amazing staff and, and faculty support. <clears throat> So as you all know, I need to end these things with a poem. Some of you know that. In thinking about a poem to capture this day and this time in our world, and in keeping with our focus this year on compassion and caring, I wanted to honor the courageous choice you all made a few years ago to continue and advance your education at PAU. You made a significant change in your lives so that ultimately, you could work toward the betterment of others' lives and the communities in which we live. The fields you have chosen offer a path toward hope for our world. Seeing your accomplishments and the pride reflected in your family and friends and the fan clubs, that shows the wisdom of your choice. So although today is called commencement or the start, we see this as a continuation of all you brought to us at PAU and all we know you will now bring to the world. I'd like to share a poem by the great Maya Angelou called Continue. Into a world which needed you, my wish for you is that you continue. Continue to be who and how you are to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. Continue to allow humor to lighten the burden of your tender heart. Continue in a society dark with cruelty to let the people hear the grandeur of God in the peals of your laughter. Continue to let your eloquence elevate the people to heights they had only imagined. Continue to remind the people 
that each is as good as the other and that no one is beneath nor above you. Continue to remember your own young years and look with favor upon the lost and the least and the lonely. Continue to put the mantle of your protection around the bodies of the young and defenseless. Continue to take the hand of the despised, the diseased, and walk proudly with them in the high street. Some might see you and be encouraged to do likewise. Continue to plant a public kiss of concern on the cheek of the sick and the aged and infirm and count that as a natural action to be expected. Continue to let gratitude be the pillow upon which you kneel to say your nightly prayer and let faith be the bridge you build to overcome evil and welcome good. Continue to ignore no vision which comes to enlarge your range and increase your spirit. Continue to dare to love deeply and risk everything for the good thing. Continue to float happily in the sea of infinite substance, which set aside riches for you before you had a name. Continue, and by doing so, you and your work will be able to continue eternally. As you leave here today, do so with tremendous pride in your accomplishments and excitement for all there is to come. I wish for you a life, a career that allows for hope, for continuing, for lifelong learning, and for taking the risks that bring you growth and opportunity. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of our gra uh, today's graduates. We are so proud of you and we wish you a happy future in all your endeavors. The 2024 commencement at Palo Alto University is now adjourned. Spectators are asked to remain standing at their seats until the platform party, faculty, and all graduates have exited the hall. Thank you and please drive safely 